Okay, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome, welcome back to, um, to the Academy. And for those of us, those of you who are joining us uh, uh, from the Global Business and Disability Network, um, welcome to the Academy on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. This is an online academy. It's providing a virtual space to learn and discuss global challenges with high level international experts, but also to interact with practitioners in regards to the realization of fundamental principles and, and rights at work. Um, this session is being offered with the normal interpretation in English and French, as well as with international sign language interpreters. And thanks to all of our interpreters for helping us to make this session possible. This morning, we're looking at the issue of disability, looking specifically at challenges, but also solutions uh, in regards to the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the digital economy. For that, we have a very uh, esteemed uh, panel joining us this morning. And to learn more about who is on the panel and what we're gonna be covering this morning, I'm handing over to my colleague, Jürgen Mensen, who is the Disability Inclusion Officer in the ILO. Jürgen, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Giselle. And thank you very much very, to the ITC who, who uh, very much brought us into this academy from the beginning. So thanks for thinking about the inclusion of people with disabilities from the outset. Um, so as Giselle said, my name is Jürgen, Jürgen Menzer. I'm a disability inclusion officer in the ILO. Before we jump into the actual content, the substantive issues of the, of the session today, I would really remind um, all participants not to switch on the camera because we are recording this and we will make it available um, to those who can't join and it is important that the window window of the international sign interpreter is sufficiently big enough um, so those who use international sign can actually follow this session afterwards and now of course too so we'll only have the cameras on for the speakers and the moderator myself and of course international sign interpreters who are joining us today um, as Giselle said we have also interpretation into French and for any questions um, you have um, on the topic to specific um, uh, speakers, please use the chat function. We will have an opportunity in the last half an hour or so of this session to address the questions you sent through the chat. And we very much encourage you to ask questions because it's a unique opportunity. We have a, a very interesting panel for, for you today. Um, but uh, just just a few remarks about the topic itself before I introduce the panelists. Well, the, the session is called Disability in the 2020s, a digital decade for an inclusive world of work. And um, when reflecting on this title, we know that digitalization is a mega trend and um, it's, it's unlikely to stop. Whereas inclusion and uh, the inclusion of persons with disabilities in particular can maybe seen as a trend, I wouldn't dare to say it's a mega trend, but there's always the risk that inclusion issues, equality issues, um, um, kind of people lose interest, so to say. There's always a risk that um, these issues are not sufficiently addressed when we talk about the world of work in general, the mega trends of the future of work. So this is important to remember that this is not a, uh, uh, automatic thing, right? So we always have to have, keep pushing for the inclusion of people with disabilities. And we know that 2020s, this decade, has started with a worldwide, uh, a shock to the worldwide system, really, with a pandemic. And it had revealed so many pre existing inequalities also for persons with disabilities. Um, obviously, the pandemic has also accelerated the digitalization. So that's why we think this, this, um, this topic is, is pertinent. Um, we will have about one hour for discussion with the panelists first. Um, I'll ask them a few rounds of questions. And as I already mentioned, we'll have about half an hour at the end for the questions that you will provide through the chat box. So now before I start introducing the panelists, I would like to ask uh, colleagues at the ITC to launch the first poll to get a bit of an impression from you, you participants, what your 
um, what your impression is about what are, in your view, main barriers for persons with disabilities to get IT jobs. And you'll also see it's also available in, in French. So while you look at the questions and answer them, hopefully, I'll say a few words about the panelists who have joined me today. And I would also ask them to activate their camera while I'm introducing them. So Neil, Neil Milliken is the global head of accessibility as Atos. Atos is also a member of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network. And Neil's role is to help make the world a better place by delivering better technology uh, for customers and staff, embedding inclusive practice into the processes of organizations with thousands of employees and turnovers of billions of dollars. Neil is the Atos representative on the Business Disability Forum Technology Task Force. He's also a co-founder of the Access Chat Europe, which is the largest Twitter chat with a focus on accessibility and inclusion. Neil is dyslexic and has ADHD. He advocates for people with neurodivergent conditions, as well as other disabilities and additional needs. Thank you very much for joining us today, Neil. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thanks. So also we have with us Jim, Jim Nemenio. Uh, he is an experienced program manager and social entrepreneur with nine years of experience in implementing the full life cycle of projects working with marginalized and underrepresented communities, collaborating with diverse sectors of society and facilitating learning related to career preparation, disability inclusion and diversity, as well as disaster risk reduction and management. He leads the programs of Project Inclusion, which is a nonprofit organization working with a community of more than 3000 persons with disabilities to improve their access to education, employment, and community participation. Project Inclusion is a secretariat of the Philippine Business and Disability Network, which is also a member of the ILO Global Business and Disability Network. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Thanks for having us. Then to try to get a little bit um, closer to where I am in the ILO, <laughs> We have uh, Karin, Karin Sonigo, who has recently joined the ILO's skills branch as a skills digitalization specialist to support ILO constituents, so the employers, workers, and governments in the digitalization of their national vocational training and skills systems. Before joining the ILO, Karin had extensive international experience in the private sector as a learning and development specialist. She spent eight years as head of content working with language learning companies in charge of the design and implementation of online learning programs. Then she moved to a more strategic role as a global digital learning manager in the banking and finance sector, defining and supporting the implementation of the digital learning strategy across geographies. Thank you, Karine. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. So um, now, while I was introducing the panelists um, as participants, you had a chance to, to look at the poll questions and answer them. Um, and just a reminder, so what are the main barriers for persons with disabilities to get IT jobs in, in your view? And what we see here clearly with more than two thirds of those who responded, 68%, they say it's a negative attitude by employers. So good we have an um, employer with us today. Can maybe also say a few words about that. Um, the other two, not so much, just 16% uh, each. It's the access to internet and digital tools. Um, and also the, the inaccessible online training, which are not seen as, as a main barriers. It's really about the ag a, a negative attitudes employers and maybe, well, the rest of society holds about um, people with disabilities. So thanks for participating in the poll. Um, I would like to start now the, the, the actual discussion and I would like to start with Neil. Um, sorry, I actually wanted to start with Karin. <laughs> uh, 
Um, Karin. So digital jobs are on the rise. We know that, and that's why we're also here. But uh, can you please explain how the ILO, um, the International Labour Organization, is anticipating the need for digital skills training? Sure, Jürgen. Um, so yeah, uh, the impact of technologies on the way we live and work uh, means that the um, technical and vocational education and training sector uh, needs to constantly and dynamically adapt curricula and programs to include those new required skills, uh, as well as the need to adapt the way they design and deliver training. Um, so in order to face those challenges and make sure countries' uh, uh, technical and vocational education and training and skills system as a whole uh, can ensure individuals are well prepared for the local and even global labor market needs, um, the ILO skills branch have developed um, several tools and methodologies to support skills needs, anticipations and matching um, and ensure that um, technical and vocational education and training providers, whether they are in company based or not, are well equipped uh, to prepare individuals for skilling, reskilling, and upskilling. Um, one of them, one of those methodologies, is the skills technology foresight, also sometimes referred to as STF, uh, which is an approach that enables identifying the gap between the labor market demand and what the technical and vocational education and training and the higher, higher education sector have to offer to meet such a new demand. Um, this foresight tool um, begins looking at the technological trends in a specific country identifies the related hard and soft technologies, as well as the work tasks and the working conditions or circumstances for such a trend. Then uh, this approach identifies the skills that are needed um, for individual to thrive in such a new working environment with such a new technological trend and analyzes the gap between the in demand and the available skills. And then eventually proceed with recommendations for new or adapted um, training programs. Uh, this specific methodology that I told you about, the skills technology foresight, is currently being implemented in Armenia, for example, within the ICT sector uh, and food processing as well. Um, maybe another uh, technology or uh, sorry, another methodology that I can tell you about um, is, uh, for, for digital skills anticipation specifically is the STED approach, which stands for skills for trade and economic diversification. So STED is the ILO's more sector-based uh, methodology uh, that is used to provide um, strategic guidance on integrating um, skills development uh, um, into policies and strengthen uh, this way traded sectors. So it takes more of a forward uh, looking perspective um, and, a strateg and, and uh, has a strategic, if I can put it like that, focus uh, on skills development needs. Uh, so among others, TED was implemented uh, in Senegal recently uh, within the skills development strategy for the digital sector. Um, what I can maybe tell you about as well is that uh, last year, uh, the ILO also produced a, a report uh, that was out of a workshop that was conducted on the feasibility of using big data in the anticipation and matching of skills needs. So, out of this report, maybe something that I can share is that although it is you know, promising uh, approach to use big data, uh, one of the main challenges that, that are still here is the quality of data and the kind of non-standardization uh, of information that is being retrieved online that, and, and, and the type of information that you can find in job boards, in uh, job descriptions, or uh, in CVs or resumes, for example. Now, um, uh, Jürgen, you've mentioned digital skills specifically for the digital economy. 
Uh, maybe I'd like to point out that um, although uh, out of those different surveys and studies that we've uh, uh, carried out, um, we have uh, identified or extracted different levels of digital skills need from basic to intermediate or advanced, and that are based on specific occupational needs. Um, we should still uh, you know, mention, and I'm sure uh, other panelists will, will agree that um, technology is not only required digital skills per se, but uh, also uh, more uh, core skills, such as you know, communication when it comes to hybrid workplace, for example, or working in digital platforms, uh, management, uh, you know, managing or leading teams that are dispersed because of the use of technology or, or teleworking, um, the capacity to learn, unlearn or relearn, or the you know, learning how to learn uh, kind of phenomenon. So, uh, which are definitely critical today to, um, to mention only some of them. Um, yeah, so here, um, here are my, my thoughts on, on, on your question, Jorgen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, th thank you very much, Karin. I, I, I specifically find it interesting that, you know, the, the, the quality of data that you mentioned that is always key for our work as, 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 as those trying to positively influ influence uh, public policies on, on whatever. So that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's an important point, um, well noted. And also, of course, I mean, just a reminder that we as international labor organization, as, as part of the United Nations system, obviously also we have a focus on developing countries. You mentioned a few examples, Karin, and, and I think that's, that's always important to remember. So thanks so much, Karin. I'll, I'll um, get back to you uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, but before we hear from, we would like to hear from Neil. Um, my question to Neil is, uh, as an IT company, how does Atos promote the digital inclusion of persons with disabilities um, as workers in both Atos and Atos partners? Neil. Thank you. And, and, and if, I, if I may just describe myself for those that, that can't see me, I'm a white middle-aged male slightly squinting at the camera because I've taken my glasses off because the, the reflection is too, too much. I'm wearing a dark gray jacket and a blue shirt and I have a closely cropped beard and short hair. So, uh, and an internet famous big leaved green plant behind me because um, people love to comment about my plant. So distractions aside, uh, Atos is committed to improving our work on accessibility. We run a, a, a global program focused on inside and outside of our organization. And it, it, it really uh, concentrates on a number of themes because we realize that it can't just be uh, one thing that we do. We have to take a, a, a sort of full organizational holistic view of accessibility and, and inclusion. So we have a number of work streams that are looking at uh, what we call employee experience, but it's, it's essentially both uh, uh, how we recruit, retain, motivate, reward our uh, employees, including our disabled employees, uh, looking at things like training. So not just um, the accessibility of the training uh, and the suitability of the training, but also providing training about accessibility, about disability, about diversity topics, um, and then more specialist training, role-based training on accessibility for people within the business, because we're a digital business. And in order to be inclusive, we need to make our digital assets work for people with disabilities. So there are a range of different topics that people will need to, to know, from the simple, how do you create accessible documents, to how do you deliver good customer service for people with disabilities, uh, to more complex stuff like how do you test with assistive technologies, how do you design and code to be accessible, etc. So we, we do those things, but we're also looking at our portfolio of products. And as a, a large IT company, we, you know, we call ourselves the digital transformation, but you might better think of us in the old school terms of being a systems integrator. We, we work with a lot of different technologies and we have to make them work together. And actually, the art of making stuff inclusive is about that integration. It's about that interoperability. So we need to make sure that there is interoperability between the assistive technologies and 
the technologies that we're giving to our customers and our employees. Essentially, they're the same thing because our, our, our employees are internal customers of our services. So there's a, an ongoing piece of work there. And the fact is that we don't always own these technologies, we buy them in. So there's another work stream looking at how do we procure these technologies and make sure that they're as accessible as possible. So um, in, in that case, we have to work with our partners and suppliers. And, and we, we try to treat our suppliers as partners because we believe that through working and collaborating together, we can make uh, greater start strides and, and, and quicker changes to, to make stuff more accessible, share best practice, et cetera. So, so uh, one of the, the key motivators for joining networks like the ILO GBDN is for sharing that best practice and also to a certain extent, creating leverage because applying a little bit of friendly pressure on our partners is useful and also having it applied to us as a supplier is useful for, for me in my role as the person driving that change to be more inclusive in the company there is nothing more helpful than our customers coming to us and saying this is something that we demand so so we're doing this and so of course i encourage our partners on both sides both supplier and customer partners to be engaging in that dialogue not just with me but at the at the the top level of organizations because those are the things that start to bring about systemic change. At the same time, we have cultural issues that we need to deal with as well, because uh, it was clear from that, that survey, and I answered the same as everyone else, that attitudes are the biggest barrier. So, so therefore we need to be changing hearts and minds within our organizations and within the sort of ecosystems of organizations that make up the IT industry, uh, which feeds most of the jobs these days and feeds most of the digital economy. So um, some of the stuff that we're doing is, is making it safe to self-identify as having a disability. Lots of different countries have different regulations about what you can ask and what you can't ask and what gets recorded and what doesn't and some countries have quotas others don't so as a result of that it makes it very complex for a multinational organization and we're in 75 countries to be able to um, have a consistent approach which is why we encourage people to self-identify and have to create that culture where it's safe for people to do so so part of that is uh is through uh, creating our employee resource groups or networks and having employee-led conversations. So this is deliberately not using our HR people. This is driven by other parts of the business and finding key executive sponsors to help those networks and make sure that they get the, the kind of support that they need from the top of the business. And, and it's really important that when we find these executive sponsors in the different geographies, that they openly talk about disability. So we're lucky to have executive sponsors that have either lived experience of their own of disabilities and are prepared to talk about it and share about it, or our parents and have immediate family. So again, they have lived experience at, at, at one step removed. So they have a genuine reason to be wanting to do this. Uh, and, 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 and that helps, I think, people feel safer to come and, and have these open conversations and start talking about disability. That can be transformative. We've seen that within our UK where we started our networks and it's helped us and it was the network that drove us to get our disability confident level three uh, certification from the government, which is the highest level. So this wasn't a, a business driven thing. This was in employee driven with the support of, of senior managers. On, on top of that, there's still uh, all sorts of other bits that need to be done around communication, language, choice of the model of disability that we apply. Uh, and we've chosen to take the uh, psychosocial, the biopsychosocial model of disability rather than the medical model or the, uh, or the social model because it sort of meets in between and reflects a, uh, it's closer to having some kind of connection to all of the countries that we work in. 
Um, and, and so we recognize the challenges that impairment may bring, but also strive to remove the barriers that we're able to remove and influence the removal of barriers of those that are outside of our control. So, so those are some of the things we're doing. And as an IT provider for, for actually literally millions of people, um, because we do a lot of sort of providing people's day-to-day -day computing experience, I think that, that this can have a significant impact. Back to you. Neil, um, as always, always uh, very fascinating to listen to you. And um, uh, uh, it's clear that you could talk a whole day about what is Atos doing in terms of including people with disabilities. And then you touched upon very many important points, some of them more complex. But I just wanted to point out um, that, look, um, I mean, we see it obvious in, in other companies too, but also as, as ILO, getting this, this ex Internal pressure helps, right? Look, look, what are you doing on disability? Why are you not doing more, right? So um, that that helps um, when you get these messages from suppliers. And you said obviously best if if the the top management hears these messages to actually um, contribute to a cultural shift in the organization or company. Very interesting point of view, obviously also about the self identification of uh, employees with disabilities, creating a safe environment for people to do so, and just uh, the point about. Um, it's not always thought about. That's why I appreciate that, that, that you said it, Neil. Also, the, the fact that um, employees might have family members with disabilities, and that also uh, changes their experience working. So thanks, Neil. Um, I'll get back to you also. Um, and also thanks, Neil, for, for the reminder that we should actually, uh, to improve accessibility for those who have visual impairments or are blind, we should also have, provide a self-description. I'm a I'm a middle-aged, I guess, not so young man anymore. Um, I'm white. Uh, I have a beard a little bit longer than Neil, but not too long. Uh, I have the International Labour Organization logo as, as my background. I'm wearing a, a light blue shirt today. Um, now over to Jim. Uh, Jim, a very easy question, um, maybe for you, but others are very interested in, in hearing from you. What is the Philippine Business and Disability Network you represent? And uh, what, what is the work of the network? Yeah, thanks, Jurgen. So hi, everyone. I'm Jim. Uh, I'm a male in my late 20s, and I'm wearing glasses and a dark blue polo shirt. I have a, a, a dark brown hair and light brown skin. So thanks, Jurgen. Uh, I think um, the, we're the, we're, I'm Jim from the Philippine Business and Disability Network. And our work revolves around, like what Neil mentioned earlier, I'll repeat it. We try to meet companies where they are and apply friendly pressure on to be able to promote more disability inclusive workplaces. But uh, more specifically, we're a for and by business platform that promotes connections, capacity building, and collaborations of businesses in the Philippines towards more disability inclusive workplaces. And I think this also uh, this reality and in this uh, introduction also applies to many different kinds of business and disability networks across different nations. But we're a young network as we launched uh, just last January 2020. And as of the moment, we have 15 members in the network and we're, we're looking to grow our membership to 50 by end of 2022. But in a, our work involves connecting companies to one. The first one is connecting companies to a talent community of around 2,500 persons with disability through facilitating technical and life skills development of persons with person with disability job seekers. And then we also match their skills to opportunities from, to, uh, from our member companies. And then the second one is we also are involved in capacity building. So we build capacities of employers to recognize, support, and nurture talents of persons with disability through learning sessions, knowledge products, and communities for disability in the workplace. And lastly, we promote collaboration. Through, uh, we collaborate with the private sector, with industry, and also in, in, the, in the case of the Philippine Business and Disability Network or the PBDN, we collaborate with government. Uh, we engage them in bilateral and multilateral levels to determine one, knowledge needs, and two, policy advocacy opportunities to improve workforce part participation outcomes of persons with disability. So in summary, we meet, uh, go, we meet pr the private sector, especially the industries and businesses where they are when it comes to promoting disability inclusion in the workplace. And I would say in the Philippines, it's fairly a young uh, advocacy. It's fairly, uh, it's fairly an emerging industry and also emerging work in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we meet them where they are, and we try to work with them and to be able to promote also 
more disability inclusive workplaces and in turn more disability inclusive uh, societies and communities so that's a good that's a summary of our work thanks Jurgen. Yeah, th thanks a lot, um, uh, Jim. Just a few points. I think you, you made uh, just a, a reminder to all of us. Um, this, the, the, this concept of National Business and Disability Network that we see also now in the Philippines for now almost um, two years, um, we, we see in, in, in countries around the world in more than 30 countries. And what you said, Jim, is so important, right? Connecting companies to discuss disability issues. We try this as international labor organization at global level, but it's so important that national networks like the one in the Philippines um, do it at, at a country level because there also you can, you can engage small and medium-sized enterprises, right? Um, and, and very important point, the policy advocacy, right? Using the, the businesses, the voice of business on disability vis-a-vis uh, -vis public policy makers is, is, is a point well taken. Thank you. So um, we'll be back to Jim in a second, but before I would like to ask the ITC colleagues to launch the second poll, which is, um, <clears throat> which is more about solutions. Let's see if that comes up. Um, there you go. So the question here is, which of the following approaches are most important to promote digital jobs for persons with disabilities? So we have, um, enforcing or adopting laws and regulations, so more the government side, and the proactive outreach to potential trainees and job seekers with disabilities, and uh, technical guidance on accessible training. So while um, the participants can have a look and decide what, what they think are the most um, important approaches, I would already go back to Jim um, with another question. So <clears throat> at the National Business and Disability Network, uh, how do you see your role in promoting digital inclusion of persons with disabilities in companies of different industry sectors in the Philippines? Yeah, thanks, Jurgen. I mentioned earlier uh, our three Cs in our work. So we promote connection, capacity building, and collaboration. But I'd also like to borrow a, a, a learning. Uh, an I'll take inspiration from uh, our, our conversations with Susan Scott Parker on the role of BD, BDNs, especially in the context of digital inclusion of persons with disability. And I think this reality also applies to the context of getting more persons with disability in the workforce. So I think the role of the BDN is primarily a conductor. So we see that BDNs can be, uh, business and disability networks can be effective conductors in building enabling environments to strengthen supply and uh, demand match uh, in the labor market for disabled talent. I think the BDNs are in a unique position to be able to get to know the side of uh, the supply side of the labor market. What are the talents available? Are persons, are, is our education system in our respective country or in our respective localities inclusive? Or do they mainstream persons with disability in the aspect of tertiary education, technical vocational skills education, or in any kind of skills development that prepare them to enter the workforce and participate actively in the workforce. The BDN is also, uh, is also exposed to, the, uh, they have an intimate knowledge of also the demand uh, when it comes to working with a person with disability talent because they closely work with companies and they know the, the, usually the hiring needs, they know the, uh, the, the uh, policies and the processes that are needed for companies to be able to uh, welcome, uh, nurture, and support uh, disabled talent within their own organizations. And through the PBDN, we've actually worked with civil society and person disability organizations. And this brought about an intimate knowledge that while there's uh, very much high need and high interest from the person from persons with disability and their the, the, from disabled people's organizations to participate in employment and also in entrepreneurship particularly in the, uh, the IT and BPO industry, which is a strong industry in, uh, in the Philippines. And however, the education system in, in our country, uh, which I also think can also apply to some realities and contexts, is, uh, leaves a lot to be desired in such a way that it hasn't included persons with disability for the longest time. And it hasn't prepared them for the growing and emerging demands by digital skills from industries and companies. So we've seen that uh, we've seen that reality, and we've, uh, we're exposed to that on a daily basis through our work with disabled people's organizations and civil society organizations. On the other hand, 
we're also we've seen demand grow from uh, for any talent uh, in the IT in the BPO uh, sector and for part, for particular skills in the fields of data data analytics, web development, cybersecurity, uh, all related in the field of digital skills. And uh, there's a and part of this talent race is a growing recognition and an investment in companies that uh, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the workplace. Is, is, uh, is a core part of, of their business. It's also a core part of their talent uh, development and talent recruitment, and also their employee engagement activities. And for many companies, uh, we've, seen this, we've seen this happen, that uh, there's a growing demand for talent. And combining these two realities together from the side of uh, prepar preparing persons with disability to participate in the workforce, and we're seeing a growing demand for uh, uh, diverse and uh, more specifically disabled talent in the workplace, we see that uh, there's an opportunity and a role for uh, business and disability networks to integrate together these two realities from the supply and the demand sides of the labor market through possibly programs supported by corporations that equip persons with disability with digital skills to help them meet skill demands of companies. And this is not something that's entirely new. Um, more and more companies are investing in uh, programs that train uh, near hire near hire candidates to be able to meet their skill qualifications. They invest in these candidates to be able to uh, bring them up the standard of within their company and bring them into the fold of their organization. So we see that there's an opportunity to be able to mainstream disability inclusion conversations into these types of programs. But another way to be another opportunity that we see is for organizations to uh, to uh, uh, it can be a starting point for some organizations that to also uh, mainstream or include disability inclusion themes within their own corporate social responsibility activities. So I think those are two. Uh, those are uh, those are the those. That's the role that we see as uh, as a BD as a BD and that we conduct and integrate realities from the supply side of the labor market for disabled talent and the demand from companies for talent. That meets their upper, that meets the current uh, demands of their organization and the opportunities that they have within their company. So yeah, I'll end there. Thanks, Jurgen. Uh, thank, thank Jim. And and just to re-emphasize uh, re what Jim said, I think this this conductor being between the supply and the demand side of the labor market is, is so crucial because oftentimes we see that in countries, um, you might work on the improvement of of. Of, of skills of persons with disabilities in general, including digital skills and companies are looking for, for people with disabilities, but the, the, the middle piece sometimes is missing. So thanks, Jin, for, for explaining that in the context of the Philippines. Now I would like to share the, um, um, the results of the second poll. Uh, people had an opportunity to respond to while, while Jim was um, speaking. And um, we see it's a more balanced, um, it's a more balanced um, uh, result than the, the previous question. Although we see that um, <clears throat> that uh, the proactive outreach to potential trainees and job seekers is 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 number one. This is seen as the most uh, important approach, whereas um, laws, regulations, and technical guidance are are on par more or less. So that's, that's good to keep in mind, maybe also for, for the remainder of our meeting today. Thank you. Um, I would also like to remind participants that, it had, that they have an opportunity to ask questions to the panelists and please use the chat box for that. Um, now I would like to go back to Karin. Um, Karin, what would be promising strategies to approach mainstream digital skills providers? So they would open up more widely for trainees with disabilities, because that's what, what happens often that mainstream providers of skills in general, including digital skills, are not sufficiently um, taking into account uh, the needs of persons with disabilities. So looking forward to hear from you what your thoughts are. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, so here we are more looking at how digital skills, or as you said, skills in general, um, um, training, uh, digital skills or skills training in general, uh, should be delivered uh, to open up more widely to persons with disabilities. So in general terms, um, 
uh, and we all know that online technologies can definitely assist, and, and Neil told us a lot about this, uh, in supporting trainees uh, with a range of different needs and abilities. And trainees with disabilities do face obstacles, uh, even with in-person instructor-led training. Uh, and assistive technologies have a role to play, uh, whether that be in face-to-face -face or online or hybrid learning environment. So when it comes to specifically virtual learning environments, um, we could say that such uh, learning environment uh, might remove some of the uh, barriers of you know, traveling to a, a training institution, for example. Um, but it still requires uh, the implementation of specialized assistive technologies uh, that can help you know, improve the learning experience of persons with disabilities and enable them uh, that way to participate in formal training uh, um, opportunities. Uh, we can mention screen readers, uh, magnification software, live captions generators, um, um, text speech software, or assistive listening uh, systems. And although um, those technologies are now expanding uh, in the marketplace, uh, benefiting from the recent technology uh, uh, advances as well, uh, there are still a few limitations uh, uh, to use them. Uh, and that includes the cost of such technologies um, uh, or software, um, the lack of interoperability that Neil also mentioned and, and, and the lack of support and training to be able to use them properly as well. Uh, sometimes the lack of languages that are available or uh, the fact that it's sometimes not possible to use some of them offline. So um, whether that be on-premises or remote uh, learning or, or, or skills development, Technologies definitely have the potential to reach more students and facilitate or even enhance uh, the learning experience for persons with disabilities, but at the same time, uh, potentially exclude them if the design of such solutions, like the initial design, uh, does not take into account uh, persons with disabilities and, and that at the earliest stages. So, yeah, though a lot of providers have done a really good job in you know, designing their training offers, and, and I'm talking about online uh, ones uh, more specifically, and designing their solutions uh, in a more learner-centric approach, uh, you know, offering offline access of content for a person who might have uh, you know, bad connectivity, for example, or offering mobile-ready applications uh, to meet the learners where they are. Um, 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 and, and even though uh, you know, uh, uh, providers have done a, a really good job in that, uh, there are still a lot to be done uh, uh, to be you know, more inclusive of persons with disabilities. So among those approaches or, or recommendations would be to include um, design thinking approach in the development of such uh, programs, training programs. Um, adopt and, and mainstream uh, a, a universal design approach um, uh, in products and services from the outset, as I said, and evolve, involving persons with disabilities at every stage uh, of, of this and, and in the learning design uh, innovation process as well. Um, and, and, and Neil also mentioned that. Um, also identify, um, if I can put it like that, like a uh, voice of customer who would include all persona in the company and, and not only, you know, uh, uh, um, um, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, uh, team members, but also, you know, each and every employee and, and type of profile in the company. And in that respect, I know that some providers uh, have um, um, designed some uh, training programs uh, to uh, raise awareness on uh, people with disabilities, uh, um, 
um, difficulties on a daily basis and obstacles that they are facing using augmented reality. So any employee can go through this uh, training program that uses uh, augmented reality and live the life of, of you know, persons with disabilities within the company, whether that be on usual you know, uh, uh, working tasks or in uh, taking uh, an online course, for example. Um, Providers should also you know, include accessibility specifications for any learning content development, uh, whether that be uh, content that is produced in the premises or for external providers, uh, to make sure that um, they are developing accessible offers and, and including uh, the assessment part of, of those training offers. Um, as I said, I think uh, uh, training providers did and are you know, making a lot of progress in, in adopting a user-centric approach, having this you know, anytime, anywhere, any device, any content approach, like the Atawadak sometimes referred to approach. And I would definitely love to say that uh, it would be great to be adding any user in this, you know, uh, anytime, anywhere, any device, any content approach uh, to make sure we are taking an even more inclusive approach uh, to, to accessibility. So responsivity of, of devices and, and of programs is good. Uh, adding accessibility uh, 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 is even better. So yeah, in order uh, for persons with disabilities to benefit fully uh, uh, from digital skills development and specifically digital skills development online as well, uh, opportunities, um, we also should make sure that um, systems themselves, uh, uh, national systems do um, establish uh, or improve uh, the way they identify, purchase, uh, uh, produce, uh, and support the use of assistive technologies. Um, um, also maybe um, systemize, if I can put it like that, um, accessibility criteria as a go uh, to register training providers in their national database. So as long as they are not you know, complying with uh, specific criteria, they would not be registered into uh, 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 the, the national database. Um, it's also important to provide, uh, you know, uh, and, and we talked about that earlier with all the panelists, provide capacity development for uh, instructors, uh, instructors, sorry, to use uh, assistive technologies and support persons with disabilities in their learning experience and learning journey uh, in any of the needs that they would have. Um, yeah, um, last thing I may touch upon is the fact that um, um, within those accessibility laws or regulations that also need, Neil uh, uh, referred to, um, we should not only look at you know, online training opportunities and the fact that they should, you know, uh, be accessible to persons with disabilities. But we should look at a more broader perspective. Uh, and because of digitalization, uh, um, um, the different functions of a system are inter can be interconnected and, and relate to each other. And so um, there's definitely needs to be uh, accessibility in uh, skills development opportunities, but also um, in labor market information uh, 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 data access, in career guidance uh, uh, um, uh, tools and services, uh, and also, uh, uh, as Jim uh, uh, touched on, uh, on employment opportunities that are, that are given uh, to, to individuals online. So it's not, not only looking out how training providers should be you know, approaching disability or, or persons with disabilities in their learning experience. But we should take a, you know, a more uh, broader perspective on um, the, the, the individual's uh, uh, journey on, on you know, uh, uh, labor market information, on career guidance, and on uh, uh, employment opportunities as well. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jorgen. 
Yeah, thank you. I think the last point you made, Tarin, is, is, is very important, right? To see uh, any actor who tries to promote disability inclusion, seeing this actor in, in a wider context, in a more co comprehensive uh, picture, because obviously it, isolated, you will not achieve much. You always have to take the whole context, the whole system into account. Uh, as you said, you mentioned also issues for uh, transportation, for example, if there's face-to-face uh, -face, uh, training, for example. And, and I think the point you made about universal design, uh, think about universal design in, in, in everything we do, really, uh, including um, uh, skills, skills provision is, is a key thing. You mentioned things like um, capacity building, of those instructors who are supposed to deliver skills to trainees with and without disabilities. And, um, and yeah, just the, the general awareness of accessibility. I think that, that, that's an important point. I think working with companies that they, they, those in charge of accessibility still need to convince their, their top management that it's a worthwhile, uh, not only worthwhile investment, also an ethical issue to do. So, so thank you, Karin. Um, let, let's go back to Neil. Um, Neil, in your view, what are the key opportunities and challenges for businesses to bring more people with disabilities into jobs in the, in the digital economy? So first, we heard from you about the particular experience of Atos, your company, but in general, what do you think are opportunities and, and, and also, of course, challenges for businesses in, in general? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So, so I think that, that, that some of the things that have just been mentioned impact on on businesses as a whole, there is a great opportunity to uh, include persons with disabilities in business as a result of digitalization um, because of the fact that we have all of these new tools um, that have real potential to enable people to participate remotely if we do it right. Now, the challenge is that, that getting it right and getting that interoperability right and 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 also we need to be mindful that actually whilst we have these guidelines these laws etc they've been designed specifically around interoperability for the most part for a couple of disability groups they don't really um fully take into account a lot of the sort of cognitive disability needs yet primarily because it's quite difficult because there's all sorts of different conflicting needs. Therefore, you can't say you must do this because that will make it cognitively accessible because there are different needs with even within cognitive accessibility that may conflict. So that designing for flexibility is, is challenging. At the same time, we really, um, want to sell the value of uh, inclusiveness to organizations because if you look at any business conversation that's happening online right now they're talking about innovation they're talking about the value of ideas the value of thinking and doing things differently and that requires people with a problem solving get stuff done mindset and 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 that's us right that's people with disabilities we solve challenges daily uh, including the challenge of my microphone slipping off the back of my head right now whilst i'm i'm, I'm on on air so i i think that these these kind of uh problem solving diverse mindsets are really important for creating teams that are going to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow because when you recruit for group or, or, or sort of team fit then essentially you're you're building in homogeneity and groupthink and, and and that's the death of an organization so it's a you know it's a it's a, a bonus for the survival of organizations when you are inclusive because you're you're actually working towards you know ensuring your own future by engaging people with disabilities on top of that i think that how do you do that i mean that that, that kind of executive buy-in that, that was mentioned takes time you know either you're lucky and you get someone at the top that gets it innately. And, and I think there is a generational change in leadership in organizations. You know, we, we see the valuable 500, uh, where 500 of uh, top CEOs around the globe have made a personal commitment to put disability on the board agenda. 
uh, that really helps, right? That opens doors uh, and it focuses the minds of the middle management, which is where stuff gets done or gets blocked because it's, it's really um, the middle management of an organization where, where stuff either happens or doesn't. So, so I think that, that these kind of things are, are helpful and that shift is helpful and getting the CEOs to talk about it and talk together about it is, is helpful too. And then giving it some kind of structure and framework because um, that's a challenge in an organization of my size or of the size of some of our customers where they're enormous. It can feel like you're boiling the ocean. So you have to um, get others to buy in and get them to help. And, and if we look at some of the analogous challenges that businesses have right now, they're dealing with things like the need to remove carbon from their operations. So what we've done within our own organization and what we're encouraging others to do is, is actually take ESG frameworks, the CSR frameworks, the sustainability frameworks and apply accessibility to that. So we've taken the same kind of structure as we have for decarbonization and, and, and applied that to accessibility. And in fact, I go one step further and, and, I, and I say we should be treating exclusion like pollution because inaccessibility is a negative externality of the production and planning process. We all produce goods and services and we all plan to do this. And it's through not thinking about accessibility, not taking that inclusive design, universal design mindset that we create these negative externalities that have an impact on individuals. At the same time, if we plan for it, we have a positive externality, the curb cut effect. So, so all of these things, once you start putting them into a mental framework and actually a, a business framework that organizations understand, it starts to promulgate, promulgate across the organization. And by doing that, you can bring in other people. So we have over 70 SPOCs across different areas of our business that it's not their day job to do accessibility, but it is part of their responsibility to own the topic within their function of the business. And on top of that, we have a, an accessibility champions network where people are talking about accessibility in their jobs. So again, they're not experts. We're providing them with training and badging and gamifying the process to encourage them to, to get more involved. But it's, it's really having people that are keeping the topic alive because you can't be everywhere all the time as an individual, as a person responsible, you have to sort of build that groundswell so that it starts becoming part of your organizational culture and, and DNA. And when we do that, we have other benefits and they are not just for, for Atos, but for organizations in general, when you have an inclusive culture, you're attractive, you're going to, be much more of a, an interesting organization for potential candidates. Uh, you're going to retain employees because actually people with disabilities are already employees and lots of employees acquire disabilities during their working lifetime. And one of the things that cost businesses the most money is recruitment and losing employees and losing knowledge and skills. So if you can get your management to understand that by being more inclusive, by being accessible, you're going to save a ton of money, retain knowledge, retain skills, improve employee experience, then you'll get the buy-in. So a lot of this isn't about technicalities. We do teach the technical skills. We are doing stuff around training. I can put some links in the window about the initiatives that we're doing in places like Africa to look at the educational pipeline to make sure that the, the other part of the equation, which is making sure that the people with disabilities that we wish to employ have the business relevant skills and also doing things like apprenticeships where we're uh, defining what it means to, to be a professional in accessibility. And so all of these initiatives have to sort of move along in parallel. So um, I, I would say this, if you wish to come and work in accessibility, get good at keeping plates spinning because it's not a sort of sort of 
one single task and maybe that's why there are so many people with ADHD in the job because we find lots of shiny new things to to be doing uh, and, and keep us interested so loads and loads of opportunities for for businesses to think differently to acquire talent and 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 that that we are the hidden talent pool for uh, powering business for the next generation so I, I want to end it on that kind of positive note thanks neil i i hope you already claimed the copyright for expressions like what the the the, the hidden talent pool for empowering the next uh, generation or something and i very much also like the treat exclusion like pollution if you haven't claimed the copyright the ilo will do so no it's a, it's a it's a it's a very interesting range of topics you addressed i think i just want to pick a, a few like the, the the fact that i mean you you started with the Actually, the challenge of addressing the different needs, different uh, types of, of I mean, different groups of persons with disabilities might have, including the group of, 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 of uh, neurodiverse minorities, that it's not so easy. This works and then it works for all. It's really, um, it, it needs to be a flexible, a flexible approach, as you said, but also the fact that um, um, yeah, the, the, this, this problem solving attitude and um, this diversity of approaches, ideas is such an asset to a company and the group thing is, is the worst the company can actually have. I think that that message came out very clearly too. Um, just to say, yes, this, the, the CEO conversation, having the CEOs um, champion disability inclusion like they do in the Valuable 500, like the, the companies in the Global Business and Disability Network, which have the CEO signing the charter when the companies join, like, like Atos, is, is, is such an important point because that, that really changes the culture in the company, right? Or can, can, uh, can contribute to it. And um, this connection you made with the decarbonization of companies, very interesting because, I mean, just to say that as ILO, we're trying to more and more to bring the whole climate action debate uh, closer to the disability inclusion discussions we're also uh, launching a new policy brief um, um, soon so th all these points are very much appreciated and the, the the champions network that you have on accessibility they're not experts but you keep them entertained you keep them you said you use a ga gamified approach for that so these are very interesting points i think uh, many companies actually could uh, could adopt uh, so th thanks thanks a lot neil thank you um no, let's, uh, let's ask the same question to Jim. In your view, what are the key opportunities and challenges for businesses to bring more people with disabilities into jobs in the digital economy? If, if Neil uh, said anything that you wanted to say, please feel free to repeat it or, or come up with something. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I think Neil uh, provided really solid steps on uh, and also a very good overview of the opportunities and the challenges to bringing persons with disability in, uh, into the digital, digital inclusion and into the workplace. But I'd like to add on, uh, especially from our experience working with uh, businesses and also with uh, disabled people's organizations. So I think the reality and also the challenge that we're facing as uh, um, policy ad advocates and also as uh, B business and disability networks for people who are in into or positions of influence or in power is the fact that uh, whenever we go into the work of disability, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's, it's always, uh, we, all, we typically see just the tip of the iceberg, especially in our case, especially uh, when we're talking about the employment or digital inclusion of persons with disability. When you see the iceberg, it under, underneath it is a lot of barriers and challenges that even before a person with disability says that I want to work, I want to participate, or I want to enroll in a digital skills training course, or I want to work as a programmer, they already encounter numerous barriers. And I think uh, the starting point for any uh, conversation on disability, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a recognition of that, of the different barriers and challenges that persons with disability face on a day-to-day basis. And we know that, uh, I think uh, you're the one who mentioned this year again, and I'll, I'm, and I, I'm going to quote you that uh, I heard from you that persons with, disability, persons with disability are typically the last ones to be hired and the first ones to be fired. And that's the case, that, that's what happened uh, in, in our case when we've, uh, we've worked at the, the pandemic has shown num numerous adverse economic effects to so small and medium enterprises and even large companies here in the Philippines. And, Persons with disability were the first ones to be fired or were the first ones to be retrenched or they're, they're the first ones to be laid off. And even in the context of a developing nation in, like the Philippines, 
we've, I think we've yet to break out of a charity perspective on persons with disability. Our programs typically revolve around um, uh, mendicancy or supporting uh, or just looking at persons with disabilities objects of pity or charity. And another one, another challenge that I'd like to point out and we're observing is uh, I think the pace of, uh, of our development of emerging and uh, in innovative technologies is definitely greater than the pace of our work for more inclusive workplaces and communities. And we've seen that in conversations in AI. Uh, we've seen that in conversations for uh, persons with this, uh, anyone who wants to participate in mainstream digital skills training, or even just acquiring skills to be able to participate in the workforce. The pace of our development when it comes to technologies is greater than the pace of our work for more uh, inclusive workplaces and communities. So which brings me to the point of opportunities. And I think this is also some sort of a challenge and a call to action to everyone in this, uh, in this call, uh, in this webinar is to, I think we, once we recognize the barriers that persons with disability live on a day-to-day -day basis, I'd like to re-emphasize the point that Neil mentioned earlier, that persons with disability, from our, from our experience as well, they're natural problem solvers and they're very, very talented and dedicated employees. From our work supporting around 300 persons with disability in the workplace, uh, we've connected them to companies. Only 10% have left their jobs, but, and they, but they've left their jobs for higher education or for better opportunities. So literature has shown and experience has shown that persons with disability are good employees, they're productive, and there's no uh, fall off when it comes to their performance and productivity. And we continue to have an opportunity to recognize and also work with an untapped potential. Uh, to work with persons with disability, you have the skills and the lived expertise by experience and also lived uh, and their actual ex expertise as well to be able to design our technologies for all and contribute to our workplace. And then the second one is there's also an opportunity, I think right now, since uh, all of us uh, encountered a rapid transition to uh, digital setups, hybrid workspaces, and I encourage everyone to embrace the concept of remote or hybrid workspaces as it one enlarges, enlarges your talent base. Um, remote work has long been identified as a key accommodation and support for persons with disability, and you have a good chance to take a good first step to welcome all kinds of talents through proactive policies. And I hope we don't stop there. We continue to look at uh, uh, the conversation, we, look, we continue conversations on accessibility. Uh, we know that uh, through the curb cut effect that Neil mentioned earlier and research on accessibility shows that uh, accessibility, while it is essential to, person, to some persons with disability and persons with disability, it is useful to all and benefits all. And it, it doesn't just talk about uh, accessibility is not just for persons with disability, it's for all and it's beneficial for all. So I think these are the challenges and opportunities that we see as we continue to work and uh, as we continue to work in transition towards digital inclusion for persons with disability and at a larger extent participation of persons with disability in our respective workplaces in our society. Thanks, Jurgen. Uh, th th thanks to you, Jim, for these important reminders. Also, always remembering accessibility is not only for persons with disabilities. That's sometimes really stuck in, in people's mind, and we need to challenge this, this perception. Um, and, and thanks also for emphasizing again that um, 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 unlike the, the, the more general perception, um, people with disabilities are actually can be so creative and, and be, be problem solvers and uh, be such an asset to companies if the company um, or organization provides an enabling environment. That's, that's really what we're trying to achieve, right? To, to create an environment where, where people with any type of disability can strive and bring out their, their best and, and, and the best to the company. So thanks, thanks for these remarks, um, Jim. Let's, um, let's now go back to, to Karin. Um, so Karin, with the pandemic accelerating the trend of digitalization of workplaces, what is your view on telework and hybrid work arrangements, which were also mentioned by Jim just now, including for workers with disabilities? Thanks, Jürgen. 
Um, so, yeah, uh, I think we would need another additional one hour to share our views on telework and, and hybrid work arrangements. Uh, so teleworking and hybrid working um, have advanced dramatically across industries and geographies, uh, mainly due to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and for persons with disabilities. Um, Digital and hybrid working can, at first sight, and 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 in some you know uh, specific cases, uh, um, feel like it removed, uh, as we said earlier, some of the barriers uh, uh, faced by by people with disabilities. Um, both you know the obvious barriers, uh, as I said earlier, like commuting or or, or navigating uh, quite inaccessible workplaces. But also some of the less obvious, you know, uh, barriers like the biases uh, uh, in the hiring or recruitment process, for example. And and in that respect, this new normal that the companies have experienced uh, uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic um, may have benefited uh, professionals with disabilities. Still. Um, I think that even companies and organizations uh, that have embraced uh, uh, you know, other diversity initiatives still often have failed to include uh, disability. Uh, and, and it has been difficult for, for disability advocates uh, to, to move the needle in a meaningful way and, and, and recommendations as the ones that Jim and Neil have shared. Um, are, are great in that respect, uh, and, and their experience and the experience they are sharing are, are very interesting. So, yeah, how organizations and companies can create those more, um, you know, uh, friendly environment for uh, persons with disabilities. And as you said, Jorgen, and, and also Jim, um, accessibility in that respect is, is good for all the employees and not only persons with, with disabilities. Um, so, I would maybe go through some of the, you know, uh, key ingredients, if I can put it like that, of having a more uh, a friendly environment uh, or enabling environment, as you said, Jorgen, um, for persons with disabilities. Um, first thing, I, I think that, um, and again, that that might be for all employees and maybe not only for persons with disabilities. Um, there is some time a lack of consideration. Um, of the hybrid positioning versus the hybrid competence. And maybe I will tell you about my, my thoughts on that. So when, I, when I'm saying hybrid positioning, you need to be looking at an employee when is, he, he's uh, you know, uh, uh, physically present uh, in, a, in the premises or when he is working uh, you know, remotely, whether it be from home or for another, from another uh, environment. And that um, means that the conditions uh, are, are different in terms of, you know, equipment, connectivity, uh, being uh, um, close to or far from what's happening in, in, the, in the workplace, and so on and so forth. So that is the kind of hybrid positioning considerations. And there's also the hybrid competence. So am I, as an employee, whether that be a person with disabilities or not, I am able, do I have the uh, required skills or abilities to thrive in such, in such a hybrid you know, way of working, collaborating, uh, managing teams? Um, and, and these are two very different, but uh, very, key and important things to look at. So it's not only are you able to you know, use a virtual conference tool or organize your time while you are working from home, for example, but it's also the connectivity, the equipment, and all those types of uh, considerations that needs to be uh, thought of. Uh, so that's one thing I think that is critical to make sure that you know, hybrid working and teleworking are um, 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 enabling an environment for, for uh, efficient uh, working uh, conditions. Um, another thing I think for um, um, hybrid and teleworking to be, uh, to be uh, um, efficient is that um, companies or organizations need to be 
procuring um, accessible virtual tools and, and train people on how to use them. Because th there's there has been uh, you know a boom or or, or uh, uh, um, yeah an increase in in using uh, video conferencing tools, uh, instant messaging apps. Um, you know, cloud storage or collaborating tool, collaboration tools, um, they have become popular and are widely used. Uh, but not all of them uh, um, are uh, persons with disabilities uh, accessible or accessible, um, which is why it is very important for organizations to, to procure such tools and, and for IT teams to be aware that such tools should be accessible for all of the employees. So again, uh, teleworking or working in a hybrid environment is not only a matter of using you know, appropriate online tools, but use and, and provide accessible ones. Um, another aspect maybe is the, um, the fact that it's very important uh, to have reasonable accommodation uh, for different kinds of disabilities. So um, as soon as an employee will get on board, um, middle managers, for example, HR teams should be asking uh, for necessary potential adjustments and, and support uh, uh, um, persons with disabilities in their work environment, whether that be when they are on premises or working uh, uh, at the distance, uh, whether that be from home or another place. Um, I think that Neil mentioned um, uh, the uh, not only the technology, but human factor and the fact that um, uh, people with disabilities, like any other employee in those you know, hybrid working environment, um, should have someone to talk to. So we saw uh, um, in the last five to 10 years, uh, digital workplace coaches or teams that are in charge of providing tools and support to employees because of the digitalization of the working environment. So the same type of support, uh, coaching, uh, people or officials or, or officers people can talk to is critical in such an hybrid environment. Um, because working from home or distantly can be isolating sometimes and, and using new, to new tools can sometimes be a bit uh, tricky uh, for some employees. And so um, it is very important to be able to, you know, take the pulse, if I can put it like that, of employees, uh, not only reactively, uh, but also in a proactive manner, uh, is very important to also, you know, take the stress away from them uh, when, when working uh, distant, distantly, for example. Um, and, and last but not least, but I, I already, I think, mentioned that, is that it's very important to, to raise awareness uh, among employees, among HR teams, among uh, middle managers, as you said, uh, Neil, uh, but also IT teams uh, um, on the needs of, of persons, specific needs of persons with disabilities. But, but again, in a hybrid environment or teleworking environment, it comes to the needs of all of the employees. Uh, uh, to make sure that they have to support the need. So yeah, to, to sum it up, uh, uh, what I, I've been through, uh, um, uh, maybe I would say, Jürgen, uh, that it's the right technology uh, to be able to support hybrid working and teleworking, but it's also um, uh, the relevant organization or teams or officers in charge uh, who would be, you know, committed to uh, inclusivity and accessibility? That would make up, you know, the the right recipe uh, to uh, have an enabling environment for teleworking and hybrid working in general. Thank you. Yeah, th th thanks, Karin. Also, basically summarizing what you said uh, throughout your intervention, you know, the, the the combination of technology, procuring accessible tools, including like video conferencing tools but then uh, very interesting right the, the the human factor the what you call the hybrid competency uh or the competence is like not only as a worker but also specifically as a manager managing hybrid teams is it's, it's it's a new challenge for many but also of course so some people would like to work from the office and they can't some would like to work from home and they can't so it's a very interesting dynamic and uh, just say that first 
because oftentimes telework is seen as, as kind of the, the, the silver bullet, the magic solution for getting more people with disabilities into the, the labor force. But we know it's not that easy. It comes with challenges. It comes with opportunities too, but it needs to be a very nuanced um, uh, conversation. And, and thanks for, for, for shedding some light on this, um, Karin. Um, now the last question uh, to the panelists, and this one goes to Neil, um, and then um, we'll see if we still have some time for, for additional questions. But for now, Neil, um, we already heard a lot of, 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 of this, but um, maybe a, a more, um, let's say, focused answer from you would be also interesting. So how can digital technology enable uh, the inclusion of people with disabilities in the world of work, specifically employment? Thank you, Neil. Uh, well, I'm an assistive technology user myself. It enables me. I use speech recognition. I use um, mind mapping tools to help me make sense of the stuff that I need to do to, to gather my ideas that, that might otherwise be difficult. Uh, I also use text-to-speech. These things support me in, in my job. Um, we also deploy assistive technologies to all of our employees uh, and we're making them as widely available as, as we possibly can and trying to remove the barriers to, to that through process. So whilst everyone in our organisation is already entitled to uh, apply for these if they have a disability, what we're trying to do is remove those additional administrative steps. So we're moving towards actually just making the software available in multiple languages through our standard software portal. Um, and, and then if people don't use it, it gets removed. Uh, that way we, we speed up the process. We can essentially deliver assistive technology to people that need it within a matter of minutes and hours, depending on bandwidth and size of the application rather than knowing from previous experience that it might take weeks or months for people to go through a, a process which requires diagnosis and everything else. So firstly, actually, we go back to the first question uh, that you asked at the beginning of this session, what's the biggest barrier and its attitude. So changing the attitude to how people get that technology that helps um, actually is, is, is as important as the technology. That said, um, there are amazing new assistive tech tools built into the day-to-day -day working technologies. The, the fact that you have uh, captions available in many of these video conferencing platforms that 18 months ago you didn't. Uh, the, the rapid increase in rollout of language and literacy support tools, things like um, immersive reader, uh, or, or, or text-to-speech tools for people that are not screen reader users but need it for literacy. They also support people uh, for whom English is not their first language. And, and that's probably 90% of the people that work in my organization. So rolling out an accessibility tool not only helps us support our employees and potential employees, but it, it supports everyone else. So that, that additional benefit again. On top of all of this, you know, we're, we're talking about effectiveness. You know, if you, if you give someone the tools that they need to do their job, they're going to do a better job. So, um, and, and that has profound effects both on the employment prospects of those individuals because if they do a better job, they're going to get promoted, they're going to get better pay, they're going to be in positions of influence and power as time goes on, which then has this effect within the organization that when you have people that are influential and powerful, that actually happen to have lived experience of disability, that promotes uh, a culture of inclusion. So the technology is, is one part of a bigger pattern and we ought not to um, remove the, the human factors and the social factors from our application of tech. That said, uh, we, we, we talked briefly um, previously about sort of immersive experiences. We've created immersive experiences to enable people to understand distraction around ADHD and neurodivergence, um, because this is something that, that is very real. We, um, we also need to be building not just assistive technology, but mindfully designing stuff. So 
So uh, that hybrid working experience, whilst um, remote working has its benefits in terms of you know, enabling people with mobility challenges to, to participate in and to, to do work that might have been more difficult before because of challenges. At the same time, we don't want to create a sort of two tier working system where essentially if you're disabled, you, you remote work and you never get to see anybody because that social aspect is really important too. So, so finding ways to design technology that enables people to have choice, have agency it, it is really important. And, and then also uh, technology can, I, I'm gonna end, end on a little bit of a sad note, it can be disabling too. So, so, a lot of the things that we've implemented very rapidly have had positive effects, but sometimes in our desire to, to deal with the challenges of the pandemic and the rush to uh, go 100% homeworking because we had to, we've sometimes deployed technology forgetting uh, the, the inclusive design aspects. And, and that's something that, that we, we need to change. I won't end on a, uh, on a negative note because actually technology can help us monitor that process. So you can use technology to start monitoring your progress and your accessibility and your interoperability. So whilst um, all of these automated accessibility checking tools have their challenges, we can still apply artificial intelligence, robotic process automation to start dealing with this stuff at scale. So there is an opportunity in technology to, to really systematize inclusion. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish on a positive note. Thank you for finishing on a positive note, as, as we know you, Neil, uh, would have been sad to set on a bad uh, end on a sad note. No, it's great. And I think it's a good reminder that technology per se is not good or bad. It needs to employ it in, in the right way. And I think uh, also our director general at the ILO always is good in, in, in reminding us that the, the future of work is not yet written and it's not uh, predetermined by technology, but it's really about the choices um, we make about how we want to live and, and what the world of work, world of work should look like. And, and Neil, you were you, you said also, look, it's 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 about agency, it's about choice, how and when to use technology, enabling us to work productively. And as you said, there is a risk, of course, that, that it, it can lead to, to segregation if not used in the right way. So um, very important point. And, and with this, we are already coming to an end of this session, 90 minutes of uh, rich discussion. I hope you all enjoyed it. I definitely did. And I think we could listen to the panelists for hours and hours and days and days. So thanks so much to Neil, Jim and Karine uh, for making time today. Obviously, all, uh, thanks a lot to the interpreters, uh, the ones interpreting international sign, those uh, interpreting French and, um, and English. Um, many thanks uh, to the ITC colleagues who have uh, brought us in, as I said, from the very beginning, making sure disability inclusion is addressed in the academy. And of course, uh, thanks so much to all the participants who have been joining us today in the morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks so much. And uh, with this, I would like to end this session. Thank you.